as a church leader, we, we're, we're dealing with people's lives. And so how we conduct ourselves as a church leader in the communities is very important. This is what everybody wants within. Yeah, they want to be able to feel safe and go, you know, church is a, is, is a safe place. We had our Christian upbringing, we had the Ten Commandments, we had our, the Gospels, and that ought to be enough. But um, no, we needed guidelines that also could, uh, I think, I think, make us less distant from the secular world. We need to, to say things openly, to be able to address them clearly. It gives us a, a standard, and the standard is actually based on the Bible. For people to trust us, we must show the love of God to the people. That's important to be Christ-like in our leadership. The code really makes very clear in those various roles how we are to carry them out. the story of how faithfulness in service came about. Because the code of conduct is based on biblical principles, um, it just makes it very clear to people in the church, particularly church workers and clergy, what God expects of us as pastors and church workers in dealing with you know, his people, um, in dealing with um, those things which we're, we're responsible for. Going back 20 years or so, uh, the Anglican Church was starting to receive notice of complaints of uh, sexual abuse by clergy or church workers. And this was surprising uh, for many people. It was very shocking. And really for a while, we didn't know what to do about it. I think it's been necessary for a long time. And the fact that it's come in now um, is a f sign of the times, I think. The church had to react to some of the things that have happened. When the complaints of abuse started coming in and then eventually um, action was taken against um, the abusers, sometimes the lawyers or others said to us, well, where is it in the church rules that this behaviour is wrong? I think the FIS uh, document is very important uh, for us um, in general uh, because of what has happened in the past and, uh, and, and, and Indigenous church leaders have also been affected by that as well. It seemed that in the modern day and age it was necessary for us to produce a code of conduct for the church workplace just like other workplaces have. Uh, people seem to be used to that idea now and it needed to be expressed in modern day language so that it was easy for us to train church workers. I think it fits in with our, our, um, our culture t today, especially today, and this is what everybody wants within. Yeah, they want to be able to feel safe and go, you know, church is a, is, is a safe place. And, um, and our, um, and, our, and our clergy are someone they can trust and, and go to if they need to. The Professional Standards Commission regards it as its very important responsibility to be able to communicate the code and its behaviour standards to all kinds of Anglicans in Australia and to not exclude anyone uh, because of the language we might be using. And certainly it's very important to us that Torres Strait Island and Aboriginal communities are included in being able to use the code. Uh, there is certainly a need to have something that's concise 
um, that's been um, summarised. As we were developing the FIS code, uh, it did seem to us that being able to produce a shorter version uh, would be helpful for lots of people but particularly for people who have English as a second language. And I think the, the, the process now of trying to bring this message of the FIS document out into Indigenous uh, communities, uh, the, the churches and uh, the leaders and the, and the church workers, um, is very important. It's there to remind everybody who they are, what they are and what they're there for. I think for clergy, the code not only makes it plain to them what their responsibilities are, and, but also it gives them a tool by which they can say to the people in the church, particularly those who are church workers, the lay leaders in the church and so on, that we have to take responsibility for and the roles that we have. Because Aboriginal culture, it's all about trust, it's all about caring and sharing and helping others and looking after people, you know. The code and the development of it, and it took some developing, and it's just not an overnight thing, um, I think ha has helped to bring us uh, into a relevancy within uh, the secular world and, and the people to whom we ought to be bringing the gospel to and the people to, who ought to know what their laws are based on, the Ten Commandments and things like that. Care for all people because God made them. The code is a reflection of one of the two great commandments where we're asked to, to love our neighbour as we love ourselves. I think the code fits in for Aboriginal people because it's, um, it's all about caring for the children, our young people, old people. My belief is that God has created all men equal and therefore we have a responsibility to uh, serve the community, uh, that's what we're about. We're in a, in a position basically of authority within the church, but also uh, in a position of service. Hello, Neville speaking. Is that fine? You can't have up. Yeah, I'm on my way, Kendra. And we are called to serve the members of our various congregations. It should be Christ-like in the way that we treat other people. You know, regardless of, of um, uh, race or creed or age or whether the person has a disability or not, um, I think, you know, God says, you know, we do need to care for everyone. And, and from the old to the young and, you know, from a Torres Strait perspective, you know, we have what we call good passing, which is the caring uh, within, uh, within, uh, within a community and, and showing that caring to anyone that, that comes within the community as well. So that good passing uh, has always been uh, you know, passed on from generation to generation and, 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 and that's only been enhanced by, by the Word of God. The code fits in very well with, the, with Aboriginal culture in that Abor Aboriginal culture is a lot about family. For, for Aboriginals, families are very important, have, have always been, I hope, into the future uh, with our young people will continue to be and families are all about caring for one another, loving one another, looking out for one another and uh, helping each other in time of need. And a lot of the principles in the, the faithfulness and service um, reflect those family values, I guess, in looking out and caring for one another. Don't take advantage of the community. Look after others first. Look after others in your care. This is the primary pastoral care responsibility. Oh, when a church leader does wrong in the community, it breaks the church up, you know, and everything go wrong. If a leader was to take advantage of, of the community, it would be through the misuse of roles and responsibilities and delegation of powers that he or, he or she may have. Um, that would be the, 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 the misuse and therefore the, through the misuse you would not gain the trust and the support you know, of, of the people within the community. Taking care of the community and the people in your care is a, a huge responsibility 
and if they put you in a place of trust, um, taking advantage the, of them in any way, um, you know, robbing them or um, harming them or even backbiting, all those sorts of things, and if that's our responsibility, we should take it seriously. If a community was to see a, a, a leader putting others first, um, it, 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 it tells the community and the, and the people um, themselves that this is a leader that is looking out for his flock. They do feel cared for and loved, and you know, it might even it might be just giving them a lift somewhere. Um, it might be visiting them in the time of crisis, and it's just drawing alongside and, and being there with them. You don't even have to say anything, but at least if you know, if, if they know you're there, they know that they've, you know, that someone loves them and cares for them. Yeah, like you know, feel your confidence makes you feel good inside and makes the family feel good inside and you know, the church will be running good. Little children are sacred. Don't hurt them. Help them grow. It really, the kids are very important to our, our community because I think a lot of them, you know, they are the men and women of tomorrow. If we don't look after them and take care of them, then our community will die. It's our responsibility to look after little children, you know, and our grandchildren. Because little children are very important. They're a special gift from God. Yeah, the safety and the protection of our kids is, is very important. We have the, 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 this uh, custom about sharing everybody's children within our community, within our family network, within our family life. Um, like, um, you know, if your nieces and nephews, they're also your children. So therefore, that you care for them, you, 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 um, you, you uh, nurture them, you discipline them. You know, little children are sacred to Aboriginal people too. We love our children. It's, it behoves us also, you know, to look after those children, especially if they come into our care through ministry or um, through our just general service to God. Because um, if we don't care for them, then we leave them open to um, bad things that can happen to children and have happened to children in the past. They are so innocent, you know, and, and, they, and they will trust about just about anyone. So we as, a, as church leaders and church workers, we need to be in a position where we are the good role models for them to gain their trust in us. And by not, you know, not misusing their trust as well abusing their trust, uh, we've got to make sure that we ourselves are in, on, on a good foundation. Because it's no use trying to lay the foundation for others, especially for children, if our foundation itself is, is, is unstable. Um, working with children, you know, it's important that church leaders and uh, those in positions of authority um, do the right thing. Because basically, um, if they do the wrong thing, it's going to scar them for the rest of their lives. It has long lasting effects on them, not only on them, but also on their families as well. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a real issue for the whole family and therefore affects the whole community. So when we are there as clergy to help them, to grow, support them, they've got to be able to feel safe that church is a safe place. One of the benefits of the code is that um, we have to be more mindful about what might actually hurt children uh, and what will help them grow. And we could get set into a mindset that, you know, all we need to do is do Sunday school, but the kids in there are right and they'll grow. And then, well, it hasn't happened. And in some case, children have even been scarred by that experience. Jesus had a, a, a special place for children. It's quite obviously when you read through the gospel stories that the children are around Jesus, and so they're naturally around him. And I think he wanted his followers also to, to care for children, realising their innocence and also their, their maturing and growing and the vitality and, and everything they bring to a church community that Jesus really wanted them to be special and to be well looked after. Don't take what doesn't belong to you. Pay back what you owe. It's important for us also to um, not to take things that doesn't belong to us because we, we need to be 
role models in being trustworthy and honest, showing integrity to others and uh, being accountable. It's telling us not to take what doesn't belong to us. Like, you, know, you can respect that thing, but don't, don't take it, don't take it as, as for your own. So I'm not allowed to take someone's car, it's not mine. Like. I think we need to remind church leaders, because sometimes it has happened in the past where church leaders have taken money that hasn't belonged to them, mm -hmm. that belongs to the church community. Um, and I think they need to be reminded that it's the, it's the church community's money, not their own money. But it's the church's money. It belongs to them. And, and people have given money to the church out of trust. And they hope that the church will use that money for, for the church's business. So I think it's important that leaders respect that that money has been given for a purpose. I think, I think it's important for the church to know that, that when money's being counted, there's a few people there who are taking responsibility for it. I also think it's important for the leader that they can say, well, I've set up these steps so that you can trust me because there's a number of people counting the money and I'm not left with the money my own. Mm -hmm. And it protects them also from false accusation should something go, go wrong. We're all vulnerable to temptation in some ways. So I think sometimes it's helpful for, for steps to be put in place so that those temptations are taken out of the way. If the, if the church leader or church worker have gained the trust of anyone within the community, you, your own family or your neighbour or the stranger down the street, you know, um, if, when that trust is there, um, sometimes it can be abused in a way by thinking that, oh, that's okay, I can go and use this or that uh, for whatever purposes or the intentions behind it, but not, not knowing that, um, you know, you're actually breaching the trust as well. And there's also cultural protocols within communities as well about, respect, about respecting each other's uh, land or house or you know wherever they live. Uh, especially in our Aboriginal community, our Aboriginal community, when when someone takes something that's not theirs, or doesn't pay what should be paid for something, um, then it really af affects the whole community because it's a close knit community, and once you um, destroy the trust that people have in you. It's really hard to get that back. Don't have sex with someone you shouldn't have sex with. People who are in positions of trust as ministers, uh, they have an extra duty to um, look after and behave in a way that's um, in accordance with what's set down in the Bible and that if they don't, then they have to answer to God at some time. And it would affect the people of the church because who are they going to turn to now if that leader had sex with someone they shouldn't have said, had sex with? When, when the wrong intimacy has happened, it's, um, first of all, it's a, lo it's a loss of, res a loss of respect, um, a loss of faith, um, and it, it lost of trust, um, and not knowing, like, you know, uh, will these things ever be occurred again? Well, in my experience with women and children being abused, I, um, I saw many traumas in their life. I saw low self-esteem. When someone's traumatised, their life is not the same. And it takes them years and years to, to be healed and even to um, find the confidence to talk to someone about it. The social impact on the community is that, you know, we as Aboriginal people live in an extended family situation. So not only does it affect the immediate family when someone has sexual relationships with other uh, people who they, who they were not supposed to have those sorts of relationships with, but it's far reaching. Um, you know, it affects the extended family uh, as well, and, and that becomes a real issue. The church has got a greater responsibility of, um, of speaking more openly about the need to uh, care for our children. Probably the most important thing for church communities is to provide a, a safe space for children 
so they can come and, and, and be a part of that church community. But also I think uh, part of that protection is that the clergy and, and uh, lay workers can also, if they need to, sort of address some of the situations that are happening with children. If they come ac across abuse or something, then obviously to follow the directions in faithfulness in service and to report it to the necessary people. I think sexual behaviour is a very sensitive issue that uh, uh, within the, uh, indigenous communities or especially within the church environment as well. And, and there are cultural uh, issues uh, there that, 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 it has, that we all have to be mindful of. See, we, we, we as church leaders are not only to abstain from evil, but to abstain from all appearances of evil, that which looks bad. And so if, if, if I'm talking with someone behind closed doors, then people will be asking questions, you know, why is that happening? But if I'm talking with someone out in the open, then people will have a whole different view and understanding of that. Don't get drunk or use drugs. Drunkenness and drugs affect our family life because when someone's under the influence of drink, they're a different person and it, it affects the family because, you know, you've got to have money to buy the drink and the drugs. The majority of domestic violence um, in our community come, come as a result of um, alcoholism. You know, when someone get drunk, really drunk, you know, they talk big, stares them inside the alcohol. In my own life, like I, I used to drink alcohol, uh, take drugs, and I know that those things are not good for you because it can make you not only spiritually sick, but physically, mentally, and emotionally sick. And so there are major associated with alcohol and other drugs. It sets a bad example um, in, in a church environment. So as a, as a leader, you know, um, what we do um, in, in the public should also be, uh, you know, really be seen as, you know, what we do in our own homes as well. I think that's very important. The Bible says nothing about drinking, apart from be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. Uh, Proverbs talks about, you know, wine's a mocker and beer's a brawler. Um, and so it's the abuse of, of um, anything that is wrong. And uh, we, need to, we need to be aware of that. Often there are others who have, are struggling with these issues. And I think it says to them that uh, if they see the leader doing it, it's okay for them too. Mm -hmm. And I think the leader needs to model um, some sort of responsibility in that area. While I think about my family, my kids, you know, the, and my grandkids, and, and I'd like to live longer to see them. If I continue on the pathway that I was going before, then um, my life would be shortened. And as you know, like most indigenous people, like they have 20 years list, there, there's a gap, you know, in the national um, life expectancy. And so, and I don't want to be a statistic and so from my personal experience, I know, you know, like the difficulty that, that there is in walking away from it. But when you know that you're hurting yourself that badly, then there's nothing else to do but walk away from it. Don't gamble. So if a Christian goes and gambles, well, he's losing money for food for the kids you know, and clothing and things like that. It's amazing the number of people um, in our churches who, who gamble and find that they are short um, of some of the essential items that they need for day-to-day -day living. Not only you're robbing yourself, you're robbing your family, uh, you're putting yourself in debt, you're putting your family in debt. The, the problem with, with gambling in a community is that it soaks up all the community's resources, all the family's resources. People need to realise that those machines, those poker machines or the horses, um, the tabs weren't set up to give people money. Uh, they were set up to take people's money. Um, and that's, that's the thing that we, we are saying to people. Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, if you want a better lifestyle, stay away from um, gambling, stay away from substance abuse um, because it's, it's basically destroying our community. You know, people going without 
comes as a result of gambling. Um, people will go and try their, their hand at trying to win a lot of money and they'll do that at the expense of not putting food on, on the table to, to serve up to their children. If a, if a church leader or, or a church worker was to seem to be gambling in whatever form, it, it would uh, perhaps set a precedent for others um, that, oh well, if he or she uh, is doing that, uh, then, then it seems to be okay, then I'll, I'll do that as well. It became so evident through the years that, um, that uh, people get addicted to it. There's that family, family disputes, family conflicts about the money, how the money being spent and there's no money in the house for look after the children or feed the children. Um, there's no food for children to go to school. It's important for uh, clergy and church workers to avoid uh, things like substance abuse and gambling. We can't encourage people to live according to biblical principles when we ourselves are not doing that. Don't hurt your family by what you say or do. If we as a clergy or church leader or church worker, if our actions uh, we're, we're hurting people, then we need to be mindful of that. Because everything that we, we do to our children or say to our children that's got a, a detrimental meaning, we'll have to wade through that later on because we educate our children one way or the other. We are educating them all the time. I feel that it's very important that we don't hurt our families because um, our families are, are precious to us and um, they're, they're, the, they're the ones that support us even in the good times as well as the bad times. You know, we're, we're supposed to be peacemakers. So therefore everything starts at home, you know, the, the old cliche saying, you know, everything starts at home. So if, an, if we live in a non-violent family, then that, that foundation is what we carry back into the church and community of, of living in a non-violent way. The church community will look at um, their leaders, or the community at large will look at their church leaders um, for a sense of um, purity, for a sense of morality, uh, for a sense of hope, um, someone that's going to show them um, how they can have a better relationship with God, um, someone that can show them um, how they can have a better relationship with family. The church leaders there to sort of encourage people and to build people up. And so it's important, I think, for church leaders to be careful about how they talk to others. Do this in remembrance of me. I think when a church, church leader s says the right thing, but their behaviour doesn't match what they're saying, they don't walk the talk, then obviously people will think that well, that person doesn't take seriously what they're saying. I, I, I remember very clearly about a fellow who was a, a clergy who was great with people um, out in the general community, but he would come home and abuse his family. And that soon got out and it had a great impact upon his witness then in the wider community. Our first ministry point is our family. And if we can't demonstrate um, uh, our ministry to our family, it, we're going to find it very harder, going to find it harder then to minister to the wider church family in the wider community family. Tell the truth. Other people need to be able to trust you. Be trustworthy. It goes right down to the very rock bottom of the of of their job. Why why does why does that person have that job of being a leader when she or he hasn't been trustworthy or truthful? So you gotta be trustworthy, you know, so other people can trust you next time, you know, when you're looking after things for the church side and for your community and for your family, you know. So next time they can trust you then. Trust is vitally important as far as I'm concerned in ministry. And um, that means to me, uh, you have to um, walk with God very much uh, so that uh, the way in which you act and the things that you say uh, are things that people can trust. 
in, in our indigenous communities, people talk. You know, they're a close knit community, and they 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 talk with one another. And basically, you know, people need to be people of integrity. And if they if they are saying things, they should speak the truth in love. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what the Bible says. And uh, when they don't do that, it has a detrimental effect on the on the, not only the church congregation, but the whole community. And a lot of people in Aboriginal communities have had breaches of trust, not only with their own family members, but other people who have had authority in their lives in some way. And there's a long history and tradition of breaches of trust in the Aboriginal community. So trust is a big issue. So it's really important for, I think, for leaders to to model trust and be trustworthy. Well, as a leader, uh, uh, we have to be be very, uh, I suppose, uh, very much aware of that if we do something wrong in the eyes of the people, uh, that they w- won't even trust us. If, if a leader was found to be uh, untrustworthy in an indigenous community, okay, we're talking about uh, using a scenario of indigenous community where there's 100 to 200 people. So it's, you're looking at a very small community, okay? If a leader is not, as hasn't gained the trust of a community, then who will the people go to? In our own communities, they need to know that they can trust you as a clergy person with whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. And, um, and we have to be able to show our community that we are trustworthy. And I think that part of faithfulness in service, the reason it came to be was that quite possibly we weren't telling the truth and uh, we're clawing back. And, and one of the benefits of faithfulness in service is that it'll help us claw back within uh, the church and the people who've been hurt by the church in the secular world and as far as being trustworthy you can't build up any trust without being trustworthy all the time all the way we're setting an example for others to follow and if we're not truthful ourselves then how can we expect others to be truthful and so we we need to be that role model in our leadership we need to be that role model in the way that we present ourselves, in the way that we speak. And we need to speak the truth in a spirit of love as the Spirit speaks for us.